as Martin says, thank you for that, thanks for that very kind introduction, and thanks all for coming from far and away. I was just trying to work it out. I think this is the 20th year that I've been doing this, so that's, uh, which is quite a, quite a while. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about PSC overview and mainly about ERCP today to explain that to you. And I, as Martin said, it's actually been 40 years since I saw my first patient with PSC. And I'll, I'll just, if I just take you to the slides, which I don't have to, right. go to my slides. And uh, just to put that into context, wh wh when I first saw my first patient, uh, which was actually in Southampton, working for a guy called Ralph Wright, uh, I'm actually giving the lecture at the, bi at, uh, at the British Liver Society this year. It's called the Ralph Wright Lecture, which is, it works very well. And I'm gonna, my title is uh, PSC 40 Years of Progress, question mark. But I think, um, uh, there's, I think there's lots of a question mark. I think things have certainly have progressed over that 40 years. And how it happened was, uh, it was, a, it was a, I always remember it was a hot day in the summer in Southampton in 76, it was a hot summer. Uh, and uh, at that time, we were just starting to do what was called ERCP. I'll tell you about them in a minute. And we had this patient who had inflammatory ulcerative colitis, had abnormal liver function tests, and in those days, the RCP was in its really very early days. It really was, it was primitive, really, looking back at how it was now, is now. But we managed after about two hours to get some pictures, and the bile duct looked like this. And that was, that was the first patient that, that I, I saw with PSC. And uh, put that into context also, I, you, I think I've told this story before, but I, I then went up to the Royal Free Hospital with a very famous liver doctor, and I said I wanted to work on PSC. Uh, and uh, she, at the time, she, she was, uh, I was obviously terrified of her, uh, and she was marking some scripts, and she didn't look up for half an hour when I went on about the PSC. And she said, there's nothing in that. She said, you're doing iron. So I did a, a my thesis was on iron, but I managed to, to keep, keep my interest in PSC, and here, here we are today. So in that 40 years, I think we've learned a lot about PSC. Um, it's a chronic and progressive disease of the biliary tree. Uh, and it has this characteristic, as you'll see a lot in pictures to come, uh, so-called narrowing and beading of the uh, biliary tree. I'll show you some nice normal pictures in a minute, so you'll see what, what the differences are. And it can lead, uh, not in everybody, uh, we, we realised, we used to think it was everybody progressed, but they don't, they don't I'm glad to say. But, but uh, in certain percentage of patients, uh, it goes on to, to cause end-stage liver disease, but not all patients. Now, if you follow the news, you'll know that hepatitis C, which was the biggest health risk in the world, has now been largely cured. It's amazing, but, it, but hepatitis C, you can take a tablet now for three months, and it will cure 99.9% of patients, which is 0.5% of patients, which is extraordinary. So what, what's, what's that meant, as, as you'll hear later on, is that uh, the drug industry and pharma at last, after 40 years, and have a, and have a big interest in, in looking at developing treatment in PSC. So it's a very exciting time for me, uh, after 40 years, uh, to, um, uh, to know, be in the, in the field of, of PSC. So how do you diagnose it? How is it diagnosed? Um, and normally it's, it's picked up uh, often in an inflammatory bowel disease clinic by a sharp-eyed registrar on a Friday afternoon or whatever, who notice that the, the, the biochemistry is cholestatic. And for those people who aren't familiar with that, well, that means on a blood test, there's a certain pattern of blood tests which shows that the bile is not flowing properly. Uh, and you've got a thing called alkaline phosphatase is high in the blood. There is an antibody which is present, but it's not really good for diagnosis. And we've learned um, to exclude this condition called IgG4 disease, which we knew nothing about um, 40 years ago. In fact, we knew nothing about it 10 years ago. But now we realize that the proportion of people we thought had PSC have IgG4 disease, which is quite separate. I'm very happy to discuss it in questions if you want to, but I, I, that, I think I'll leave it at that for the time being. The cholangiogram, as I'll show you, is the diagnostic th uh, method of choice. Uh, and it shows that irregularity that I showed you. There are other causes of the irregularity, uh, which again, we're not going to discuss today. I, again, the big change is liver, liver histology is not used, not used routinely. Um, and um, it's uh, basically only done in exceptional circumstances. So I'm not sure how many of you have had liver biopsies over the years. That proportion, probably some of you have had liver biopsies. But it's not something we do absolutely routinely anymore, except in, in exceptions. But they are also being done in drug trials, for reasons we can discuss later on. But by and large, the, the diagnosis is made on, uh, usually in somebody who has, has inflammatory bowel disease, but not always, uh, and on the basis of, of, of an MR, MRCP. Now, we've also realized, I haven't got a slide to show this, but that there are various forms of PSC, probably at least three. Um, and the, the main form that, we've, that uh, we know about and have studied is in association with inflammatory bowel disease. But there's another disease, probably quite separate, uh, which is not, not associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so we, uh, over the last 
five or so years, we've been able to pick out all these because now we have lots of patients. So in 1976, there were less than 40 patients, 100 patients d uh, d uh, described ever in the whole world of PSC. And we've now got 7,000 patients in Europe uh, in, the, in the PSC cons um, consortium. What that means is if we can get all the data together from 7,000 patients and we can come out with some really um, important uh, findings and associations. So that 7,000 patients has, has been a is, a, is, a, is amazing to, to be able to study and to, and to have access to. So I thought I would just remind you, uh, for those people who are not familiar with it, um, to what, what uh, when we're talking about the, the biliary system and the bile ducts and the liver, what we're talking about. The, the liver is the biggest organ in the body. It's up there un under the ribs on the right-hand side. Uh, also, I'm biased. I think it's the most important organ in the body, uh, together with the bile ducts. And what the liver, liver does, it has a number of functions, metabolic functions. It regulates uh, blood sugar. It uh, detoxifies um, things which are absorbed from the bowel. And when it detoxifies, it, f it, it usually... Um, passes out compounds into the, bil the biliary tract. And that's a system of, a tree-like system, if you like, uh, of tubes which collect bile, and then they, they go through the tubes, it, the, the bile is then concentrated in the gallbladder, and then passes out through the common bile duct uh, into the duodenum, which is part of the, of the gut. Closely associated, but usually separate from the pancreas, which sits, sits here, and just behind the stomach. So for those of you who like anatomy, that's, that's where it is. Um, it's, a, it's the bile ducts we're going to concentrate on today. So that's, this is, a, this is a, what we do. This, this is to investigate the bile ducts. And when, what, so what we do is uh, mainly now what's called a, an MRCP, which is a magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatogram, uh, better known as MRCP. Um, and uh, as opposed to the test we used to do, I mentioned earlier, is the ERCP, which is endoscopic retrograde clangiopancreatography, and I'll show you the difference between the two. This is the same patient here, interestingly, uh, a normal patient who has uh, the pictures you get. Now you'll see you, you get slightly better definition at the moment. The, the bile ducts are, are more easily seen with the ERCP um, uh, as opposed to MRCP. But by and large, as I'll show you, we can get enough data from MRCP so that you don't have to go through the invasive test of ERCP for diagnostic purposes. Perhaps I could put a hands up here. How many of you have had an MRCP? Pretty good. How many have had an ERCP? Oh, that's a lot, <laughs> right? So uh, okay, so you know, you know, so, so this again, this just shows us again, this, again showing the the same patient, uh, the MRCP and the turn the lights down, yeah. Uh, so that just shows the a norm, normal patient here uh, without PSC, and that's this so-called you see a smooth system where the bile ducts uh, taper outwards in a smooth fashion. And this is the same patient, uh, MR. now you'll see the MRCP is not quite as good as the RCP, but basically it's good enough usually for, for, for diagnosis and getting better all the time. Now this is not PSC, but this just shows what sort of things you can see on, on these investigations. And these are gallstones, which have moved out of the gallbladder, are into the bile duct, causing blockage of the bile duct and problems themselves. So that's just the sort of pictures that you see with these, these techniques. So a question is for P PSC, and this is a P an early PSC patient, again having an MRCP and ERCP, same patient again, and you see that you, you really get good pictures of the MRCP. So what about, uh, what's against having MRCP? How many of you are claustrophobic? Anybody claustrophobic? Yes. So about, uh, that's fit, that fits the bill. So the main problem with MRCP is one, it's extremely noisy. I have had an MRCP myself. Uh, it's very noisy, um, and it is, it, it can be extremely claustrophobic. Uh, and about 30% of patients have trouble with, with the claustrophobia of the MRCP and uh, may have to have an ERCP as a consequence of that. Uh, it is getting better. The techniques are better. There now it's not quite... They have different forms of scanner which aren't so enclosing. So you can have an MRCP without having to, to be quite, feel quite so claustrophobic. It's as accurate as ERCP almost. It's not invasive. So you don't need to have anything, any tubes in, inside when you have it. And you can examine the whole biliary system. You can also see outside the abdomen as well. And importantly, no radiation. It does not involve x-rays. It's not therapeutic, so you can't do anything fancy with it, but and it tends to have some problems. It misses small stones, but the main problem is, is, is as I say, is claustrophobia. How good is it? Well, it's, it, it's pretty good. So if you, if you take ERCP as your gold standard, it picks up PSC about 99% um, uh, of the time, and it's specific about 85% of the time. That's really good enough for most patients to make a good diagnosis. For those of you who have may have had an ERCP and I haven't had an ERCP, that's what, this is what happens. Uh, now in my time, I've done 8,000 ERCPs, so a lot of ERCPs. 
Um, generally not for patients with PSE. As, 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 um, uh, uh, this is what happens. So you will be uh, ca come and lie on your side on an x-ray table um, and you ho hopefully will be given some sedation. Uh, in fact, I'm sure you will. And in certain parts of the world, such as Australia, it's always done under general anaesthetic um, with propofol. Uh, in this country, rarely so. It's usually given, by, given under sedation. And the tube is passed under the TV screen through the, uh, through the, the mouth. There we are. And uh, through into the duodenum. Here it is here. So this is the tube uh, uh, through the duodenum. This is the pancreas, which I showed you. And this here is the, the endoscope. There's a little, a little um, valve there called the ampulla of vata. And you put a little tube through there and you take some pictures. Uh, and that's what, that's what an ERCP is. So as MRCP has become the diagnostic choice, as I mentioned, what, what is the role of ERCP? Why, why should you need an ERCP these days? And the reason is that some people, uh, the, the results aren't very good. So if you have, don't get a good, good pictures, then you, you need to make a diagnosis, then ERCP can certainly will do that. And in some centres in Europe, everybody still gets an ERCP. Which is, uh, so if you go to Finland, for example, or if you go to certain places in Germany, they will do an ERCP when, you're diagno when the patients are diagnosed. And amazingly, we'll come back to, they also do ERCP every year with dilatation on the patients, which is A, um, as I said, in my opinion, not warranted, uh, and, and uh, B, uh, B um, uh, very expensive and uh, uh, potential risk. So you, will f you may read that if you, if you, if you go on the internet, uh, but I think you will most people would agree that that's not the standard practice. Um, so ERCP should only be, be performed under, uh, under certain roles. So the main role of the ERCP these days is therapy. So treat, well, giving treatment to the bile ducts. So what can you do with, with the RCP? Uh, you can do various fancy things. You can pull stones, you can stretch, I'll show you. You can stretch up the narrowing in the bile ducts, which I'll show you. And you can put things like tubes, stents, into the bile ducts as well. Um, and um, it's, uh, uh, there's also a thing which is a new kid on the block, which you may have heard about, is cholangioscopy or, or spyglass. Now what spyglass is, and I say this because it's becoming really quite topical, spyglass is a, so this is the ERCP instrument here. Uh, this is another instrument, which, another endoscope if you like, which is passed through the biopsy channel and goes all the way down through the, through the patient again and pushed up actually into the bile duct. So you get a direct picture of the bile ducts through this so-called cholangioscope. Each, uh, it's very expensive because these fibres that go down here are uh, it's almost each about 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. Um, and it really hasn't sh so far been shown to be terribly useful uh, in PSE. However, uh, the new technology is coming along like everything else. And there's now a trial coming along in Canada um, and a guy called Bertus Eckstein, who I know well. Uh, and they've got permission and uh, one is doing a trial of doing a cholangioscopy in, er in, in all their patients uh, at heart, so-called patients who have dominant strict, have, have narrowings in the extrapatic bile ducts, as I'll show you in a minute, they're going to do a yearly cholangioscopy, um, which is very comparable to those of you having inflammatory bowel disease, having a yearly colonoscopy. Now, this is experimental. Uh, it's a trial, but uh, it's certainly possible that may change practice in the future. So, as well as your yearly colonoscopy, you may, some people, high-risk patients, may have to have a yearly um, cholangioscopy. So that's the future, um, and we'll see, we'll watch this space really as to what's going to happen with the cholangioscope. The trouble with the ERCP is, um, is, is it carries, because it's invasive, you're putting a tube down, you're putting a, a, a catheter into the bile ducts, it does have complications. And the co complication rate, though, in diagnostic ERCP is about 2%. You know, one patient in 50 will have a complication of pancreatitis, which is usually mild. Inflammation of the bile ducts, or very rarely um, a, a small bleed, which is which is rare. And it's been, I think, said correctly that diagnostic ERCP is safe, but clearly it's not as safe as MRCP, which in which you don't put any tubes in at all. So we try and avoid ERCP. I've always taken the, the view that you should avoid ERCP uh, until you until you uh, absolutely need to do it for for, for, thera for therapeutic reasons. So our ERCP rate has really been quite low over the years. Now you'll hear me also uh, talk about, or I have, have talk about intrahepatic and extrahepatic PSC. So this is a diagram here showing a patient with PSC who has narrowings uh, of the intrahepatic ducts, so-called intrahepatic PSC, and a proportion of patients, not everybody, has also has strictures in the extrahepatic bile ducts outside the liver. So the liver's here. These these ducts are within the liver. Outside the liver is the bile ducts, and it, when you have a narrowing of the extrahepatic bile ducts, uh, you get a thing called a dominant stricture. And that, so, so patients who have dominant strictures will have this cholangioscopy uh, on a yearly basis. And we know that people who have dominant strictures 
but by and large do worse than people who don't. Uh, because you get more likely to get jaundiced, um, of, of, uh, high bilirubin in the bloodstream causing a yellowing uh, and jaundice. Um, you can get inflammation of the bile ducts called bacterial cholangitis, and also you can get malignancy. This is, a, this is what the strictures look like if close up. So the, what you do in it to, when you uh, understand what strictures are, they're like little um, uh, bits of fibrous tissue, thick, thickening, uh, thickening in the bile ducts, which narrow is a bit like a, a, a pipe in a, in a loo, I suppose, which gets filled up. Narrows the, the, so normally the lumen is here, that's how wide the bile duct is where the bile can flow. These narrowing stop the bile flowing, and that's actually what, what, how PSE causes damage. The bile can't get through, and you get uh, problems with the liver because of that. We know that uh, dominant strictures, it's interesting, this is German data, uh, again, uh, and their hands over, over a long period of time, uh, over most of their patients develop dominant strictures. That's certainly not true in our patients, well, I'm glad to say. And I, I think it's less than, see, less than 10% of our patients get a dominant stricture. So it's not something we see, and the reasons we perhaps can discuss that. So we do not see a lot of dominant strictures, I'm pleased to say. I'll leave that. So the then the question is, as a patient, when will a, a, a consultant advise you to have an ERCP? Uh, and uh, the reason is when this d uh, picture here again, so this is the bile duct here, bile duct here, and there's an, uh, you can see a tight narrowing here, and, and that's causing a problem. The, it's causing a problem with bile flow, so uh, often itching gets worse. So if, if, you, if you develop uh, an onset of worsening of itching, um, then that would be, uh, or become jaundiced, uh, or get uh, attacks of cholangitis. That would be an indication then for doing, uh, after doing an MRCP, to do the ERCP. Uh, and that's when people would recommend you have your ERCP. What, you, what can you do? Well, you, uh, at, at, the, at the ERCP, you put a wire across the stricture, which I'll show you, and you what's called so-called balloon dilate, which uh, sounds pretty dramatic. But so what you do is it's just the same as what you've heard about coronary arteries. I'm sure most people have friends who've got, had coronary artery stents put in. And it's the same thing. So in the coronary arteries become narrowed, just the same as the bile ducts. You put in a balloon just under a wire, put a wire through for a by a balloon, just like this, and you blow the balloon up and you actually stretch that, that the narrowing. It's as, uh, it's as sort of simple, simple or as complicated as, as that, really. So that's what b balloon dilatation uh, is, both in the coronary arteries and in the bile ducts. So this is, a, I won't go through all of this, but this again, this is show the ERCP uh, tube in the, in the, uh, in the duod duodenum, and this is the balloon shown here, blown up and stretching and stretching the, the bile duct. Uh, what you, I'll leave that. So this is what you see, this is before and after. So this is a, a patient who has a stricture causing problems. A very, this is the common bile duct here, which is terribly narrow. So there's no way that bile is going to flow properly through that. And then after the balloon dilatation, you see it's been opened up quite considerably, and the bile can flow much better. Uh, and that's what you're trying to do. So the next thing that happens is, you may have read about, is as well as, uh, as, as, as balloon dilatation, you can, you can put a tube in, what's called a stent. And what you do is you put a, put a wire up and then you put, as well as doing the balloon dilatation, you can put a plastic tube usually, or a, or a, a, a mesh tube, uh, up through the narrowing into the liver. So the bile can then flow through the tube um, and out into the duodenum. So the, the blockage is, is removed by doing that. But it's been very controversial as to whether that should be done or not. So I'll be interested to know if anybody, I wouldn't ask if anybody's had a stent put in, but that it's been very controversial um, over the years as whether everyone agrees you should do balloon dilatation. Everybody does not agree you should put a stent in. And we've actually avoided always doing that here, I have to say. Um, and this is some data just to show, lot, oh, very old data, but they looked at patients who had balloon dilatation or balloon dilatation and stent, and the results were, were the same. And I've always regarded this as being, although it's not a, a, not a prospective study, it's been looking back at results. Uh, uh, that's been, uh, uh, for me, uh, an important paper showing you should not put stents in uh, uh, largely. So there's a, uh, and then if you do look at people who have had dilatation uh, of their strictures uh, over the years, there's quite a bit of evidence actually that people who had a successful balloon dilatation do better than they would have done otherwise, uh, with a, with a uh, survival better and also less time to having a, needing a transplant. So balloon dilatation is a proven therapy. It works very well in patients who have this dominant stricture in the extrahepatic bile duct. Stenting remains conjectural. There's a control trial going on, you'd be glad to know, which is actually just finishing. Uh, it's, 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 it's been done in Holland. So uh, patients who require to have a stent, uh, uh, require to have a dominant stricture, uh, the, the doctors doing the RCP, they phone Holland, and Holland draws an envelope uh, to, and then you just draw whether you have a balloon dilatation um, or you get balloon dilatation plus you get a stent put in. Put in. 
It's an amazing study to do because it's so difficult to do really in practice. And I actually refused to, uh, to enter into this. I thought it for various reasons, I don't believe in stenting, uh, that we should just um, not enter this and just carry on our normal practice. But they did ask me to be the monitor, so I'm the monitor of the trial. And um, I'm not allowed to tell you the results at the moment, which is sad. Um, but all I can say is there's a very Im important result which I'll tell you about next year if invited, okay? Um, um, uh, but it w th th the answer is there is an answer and um, it's uh, quite clear that, uh, that uh, there's a, there's an impo there is a, uh, a definite improvement. So um, this is, these, are the, uh, these are the recommendations of, of EASL about, about dilatation in the RCP. It does say biliary stent should be reserved for patients where stricture, dilatation and biliary drainage are unsatisfactory. In my mind, that's really very rare, very, very rare. It's very important to cover the, ha to have antibiotics. So if you ever have need this done, make sure your doctor is prescribing antibiotics. What, what you don't want to do is get infection in the bile ducts uh, as well. So I thought I'd leave you with the future. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, uh, I declare interest. I'm, uh, I'm involved uh, in an Oxford University spin-off spin -off company called Perspectum. Martin knows them well. Um, and what they've, as well as other things, they have one chap who's doing nothing else at all, he's a very good guy actually, um, who uh, is uh, developing a, a new way of looking at the bile ducts, particularly in PSC. And this is um, uh, some very exciting pictures. So what he does, he takes a, I can't hardly say that, he takes the, the MRCP, which we, we give him, and then he's able by some very clever software to get some wonderful pictures of the bile ducts. And also he can do some very clever software to actually measure the, the narrowing of the strictures which will enable us in time to see whether the treatment is effective uh, and also hopefully to do regular scanning. So I think this is uh, very, very exciting. We're looking at um, pro prospective MRCPs uh, with, a group with a group in Stockholm who have a number of patients. Again, just to say, you will, n you will have read, if you do a lot of reading about this, that certain places in the world, a lot of places in the world, do yearly MRCP. So they have an MRCP every year uh, in this condition. They're trying to find uh, early changes of, of pre-cancer, really, in the, in the, in the liver. However, uh, uh, they think there's no evidence for that, uh, in my opinion, um, and uh, therefore it's not, uh, it's not uh, done in, in UK, and, and there's little evidence actually in anywhere else in the world as well. There is some evidence from Australia that actually in, in their practice, they looked over five years, they couldn't pick up anything at all in time. So if you, will, if you wonder why we don't do it, I don't think it's evidence-based. What I do think is that technology is improving so it may well be in, in patients who are, are at risk of getting a problem in, the, in their bile ducts as time goes on, is that those patients will have a specialised MR like this uh, and uh, hopefully pick up things at an earlier stage. So, um, uh, Martin, do you want know any more about um, PSC? Or was that, is that okay for the time being? Um, can I just come into your talk? Yes, please do. Anyway, so thank you. That's, we'll then take some questions as we go. If I haven't given enough information about PSE today, then please feel free to ask in the, in the questions later on. Thank you very much.